chaired this last year said we are on the right side and that's what Dan Hopen says here 12 months ago. We are on the right side. We are the people who kept the tradition and the honouring and the culture of our republicanism alive. When others went their ways when they were bought to go in to institutions like Linster House, Stormont, and down the road, Westminster. We've seen in the 26th county, or the 30, or the 6th county, rather, elections, even though of some of our former comrades were elected, <laughs> They were downtrodden on. And it's a lesson to them that you do not go into such institutions because they are not Republicans no more. The same thing happened down here in Kildare Street in Dublin when they got elected with a fairly large amount the last time that we are no part of, never have and never will be a part of any of these institutions. So it tells you the kick they get when they try to go into these places. And as the Sunday Post one time said about Tally Mansells, about Adams and his crowd, that they had him in the culvert. And so all they had to do was build the bricks around them. And Rory O'Grady told them so. That's their business. But it just tells you and it, that they'll never learn. We cannot ever and won't be part of any of these institutions. We will stay as the true standard bearers, be it 2,000 of us or one person or 5,000. 
of five people, we will always stay true to what we are supposed to do in our constitution and stay until England has declared a day to leave Ireland for once and for all. And since 1169, they sure had plenty time to make up their mind. First of all, now comes to Reed Lane, and I'll call on Tommy Cole, veteran Republican from Kunda Ross Command, Regna to lay the reed on behalf of the Republican movement. Tom, now I'll hand you back to your Chief Marshal for the dipping of the flags. I'm going to have a lament from our pipe here on my right. Uh, the first speaker today is, on behalf of the National Graves, Peg Galligan, and there will be a collection taken up in the cemetery on behalf of that organization, who does so much to keep the graves and cemeteries and monuments of Republican comrades uh, in order and very well kept indeed. And I call on Peg to give a short oration. The origin is the public colony. This year of 2022 20, marks one of the anniversaries of the most poignant and tragic events that occurred in the last hundred years, the partition of Ireland, six counties under the British rule, with problems, murders, <coughs> defranchising the population, and brother against brother, comrade against comrade. And there's a book written about that terrible era was so aptly titled, Green Against Green. But how one might ask did it all come to such a terrible conclusion? Well, two volunteers based in London, Reggie Dunn from Sandy Mount in Dublin, Joe Sullivan from Bantry, County Cork, were secretly members of the IRB, who were members of the London Brigade, who were subject to uh, IRA uh, headquarters in Dublin. They received a, an ultimatum from White Collins to assassinate Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, who was one of the most dreaded and feared of the British 
established without the day, though he was originally from near Edgewoodstown in County Longford. He was assassinated and immediately afterwards, Collins was contacted by uh, one of the, uh, the Welsh wizards and he was issued an ultimatum to him, which Collins, for whatever reason, he ignored it completely. But he certainly didn't end at that. And Winston Churchill, his Secretary of State for the Colonies and another bitter enemy of Ireland, issued obviously the same ultimatum and he was as follows. That as long as those, vol those volunteers in the four courts remain in situ, they were now in breach of the uh, arrangements that had been made during the uh, negotiations in England, that they would be crushed forthwith or else. And the or else was that there would be a, a that there would be an airstrike on the four courts. During 1916, they had used the helmet because there were several buildings. But this time round was just wood building one target and they threatened and of course they capitulated to the British and Emma Dalton went to General McCready and asked him to provide the guns and they would attack the four courts, which this year marks the hundredth anniversary of the attack on the twenty eighth of June nineteen twenty two. But of course the the leaders of the Republican forces were arrested and imprisoned. And the bitter civil war enraged the whole country. And of course, England looked on in glee. But Reggie, Don, and Joe Sullivan were executed on the 10th of August 1922 in Wandsworth Prison in England. At that stage, of course, the civil war was raging, and they weren't exactly a priority with either side of the conflict. They lay there for 45 years in oblivion. But in the meantime, of course, the National Graves Association always campaigned for the release of the remains that were be interred in Ireland. And so also did some of their comrades, of course, who survived. It took 45 years for them to be eventually under the uh, Harold Wilson Labour government to grant that the release be arranged. And they were brought home to Ireland and are buried in Dean's Graves Cemetery in Dublin. It was ironic that what divided the country on that occasion of the funerals united it because many of their comrades stood there shoulder to shoulder in remembrance of those two brave volunteers who died for their country. But at the same time, there are still other prisoners who are ignored because of all the years that have gone by and all the, the treachery that has taken place in Ireland. But they were volunteers who, even when the fledgling dream of the Irish Republic just lay in ruins, they were there to man the barn of Wayne, to keep the free freedom of Ireland in their hearts and alive. And we must never forget them. Just this opportunity to say, great as more, look up the and hit on showing you for your support and your contributions to the national days. We remember at this time today, of course, all our Republican dead, from Wolf Tom, the father of the Republican down right to this very day. We tell the nation that the grass is all for many a weary year, yet their memory is still for the land of God. The spirit will linger still. We come to the main part of our commemoration today and I'd just like to introduce this lady here on my left who indeed needs no introduction because she has been a life life long Republican all through splits thick and thin and along with some of her friends they kept the head office, they kept the movement going through bad times, especially after the last split. And, uh, you know, these are the people, they say, in our association in the GA, that they're our own song heroes. But in, in republicanism as well, there are, every day, we all do a little bit, but there are a lot of people who do an awful, awful lot 
extra that cannot be seen and they're doing it behind the scenes in line of running the office and other things. Cork woman originally from Rebel Cork and proud of it. Walam Kurunul Rib, the Shinora of Jahor, Yita Yihawal. of 1.5 million or 41 percent of the population no figures were given for the number of people that were transported to Barbados the Irish people were left without leadership after the siege of Limerick many leaders fled to France and other countries in Europe and were fighting in foreign armies or had collaborated with the English government in order to keep their property and in 1695 the penal laws were enacted they included Catholics were not allowed to sit in Parliament, not allowed to vote, excluded from positions of trust, not allowed to do paid work, forbidden to travel five miles from their home, to keep arms, maintain suits of law or be guards or executors. Any four justice of the peace could call a man over 16 before them and if he refused to abjure the Catholic religion, bestow his property on his next of kin. No Catholic could, could employ a Catholic schoolmaster to educate his children. Catholic priests would should be hanged any Protestants suspecting another Protestant of holding property in trust for a Catholic might file a ga bill against him and take the property from him. Any Protestant, and this is one of the worst, I think, any Protestant seeing a Catholic tenant to will on a farm, which in his opinion yielded more than one third of the yearly rent, might enter on the farm and by simply swearing to the fact, take possession. Any Protestant could take a horse from a Catholic, no matter how valuable, by simply paying him five pounds. Horses and wagons began belonging to Catholics were in all cases to be seized for the use of the militia. Any Catholic child who became a Protestant could at once take possession of his father's property. And these are, this is not the whole lot. This is just a sample of the penal laws that the people in the 18th century lived under. The state of the ordinary people deteriorated. The vast majority were relying on small holdings rented from ascendancy landowners from which they could be evicted at the will of the landlord. Ireland had its own parliament in Dublin which legislated for the Protestant ascendancy. No Catholic could be elected to it. Wolf Tone and the United Irishmen, though mainly Protestants, saw the injustice suffered by the vast majority of the Irish people and they vowed to change it. The French and American revolutions which took place in the latter end of the 18th century changed everything, proving that people could throw off their change and fight for freedom from oppression. Theobald Wolfe Tone was born on June 20th, 1763. He studied law at Trinity College, Dublin, my own alma mater, where he became an active member in the Theo College Historical Society Debating Club and was elected <coughs> as auditor in 1785. He was made a scholar in 1784 and graduated BA in February 1786. He qualified as a barrister in King's Inn at the age of 26. As a student, he eloped with Martha Witherington, daughter of Charles and of William and Catherine Whittington of Dublin. She would, go, he, she would go on to change her name to Matilda at Tone's request. 
In September 1791, Tone published an argument on behalf of the Catholics of Ireland, signed the Northern Whig. He displayed the growing breach between Whigs like Henry Flood and Henry Grattan, who sought Catholic emancipation and parliamentary reform without severing the tie to England. Tone expressed contempt for the constitution Grattan obtained from the British government in 1782. Himself an Anglican, he urged cooperation between the religions in Ireland as the only means of obtaining redress of Irish grievances. Sharing Tone's frustration with Protestant patriotism, William Drennan proposed to his larger Presbyterian friends in Belfast, quote, a benevolent conspiracy, a plot for the people, unquote, dedicated to the rights of man and to real independence for Ireland. Attending their first meeting in Belfast in October 1791, along with the man from God knows where, Thomas Russell of Cork. Tone reiterated the trust of his argument on behalf of the Catholics of Ireland. The imaginary revolution, as he called it, of 1782 had failed to secure a representative and national government for Ireland because Protestants had refused to make common cause with Catholics. Ireland would continue to be governed in the exclusive interest of England and of the land of the ascendancy so long as Irish Protestants remained, quote, illiberal, bigoted, and blind, unquote. The Society held its inaugural meeting on October 18, 1791. Tone quickly established authority over the proceedings, suggesting a new name for the Society, drawing up its resolutions, and penning its declaration calling for an equal representation for all the people in Parliament. The United Irishmen Society spread rapidly across the Presbyterian districts of the North to Dublin and an alliance with Catholic defenders across the Irish Midlands. Aiming at no more than the formation of a union between Catholics and Protestants to press for parliamentary reform, Tone's membership of the Society was not deemed incompatible in 1792 to his appointment as Assistant Secretary of the Catholic Committee. When the British government questioned the legality of the Catholic Convention called in December 1792, Tone drew up for the committee a statement of the case in which a favourable opinion of counsel was obtained. In April, Dublin Castle put its weight behind Grattan in the passage of a Catholic relief bill. Catholics were admitted to the franchise, but not to Parliament or Crown offices on the same limited property terms as Protestants. They could again be called as barristers and serve as British army officers. They could not, however, enter Parliament or be made state officials above grand jurors. The Maynooth College Act of 1795 was passed and the same year as the Orange Order was found and I don't think that there's any, uh, that, that was, I think that was very, <laughs> very well planned by the British. Good Jones' principles were drawn from the French Revolution and he was a, he was a disciple of George Danton and Thomas Paine. In 1794 the Society of United Irishmen became a sworn association using oaths that aimed at the overthrow of the Kingdom of Ireland. Given that France and Britain had been at war since 1793, administering or making such oaths turned a reformist republican society that had wanted to extend the franchises in the existing system into a republican revolutionary one. Also in 1794, United Irishmen persuaded that no party in the Dublin Parliament, where being an MP was limited to Anglicans, seemed likely to accept their scheme of universal manhood suffrage and equal electoral de districts began to turn their thoughts to a French invasion. An Irish clergyman living in England, the Reverend William Jackson, came to Ireland to ascertain to what extent the Irish people are ready to support a French invasion. Tone drew up a memorandum for Jackson on the state of Ireland, which he described as ripe for re revolution. The memorandum was betrayed to the government and in April 1794, Jackson was arrested on a charge of treason and committed suicide during his trial. Several of the leading United Irishmen, including Archibald Hamilton Rowan, fled the country. The papers of the United Irishmen were seized by the Dublin administration and for a time the organisation was broken up. Tone, who had not attended the meetings of the Society since May 1793, remained in Ireland until after the trial of Jackson and was advised to leave Ireland in April 19, 1795. He emigrated to the United States, where he arrived in May 1795. Before leaving, he and his family travelled to Belfast, and it was at the summit of Cave Hill that Wolf Tone made a Cave Hill compact with fellow Irish radicals 
including Thomas Russell and Henry Joy McCracken, promising never to desist in our efforts, and we have subverted the authority of England over our country and asserted our independence. Living in Philadelphia, Tone wrote a few months later to Thomas Russell, ex expressing unqualified dislike of the American people whom he imagined to be no more truly democratic in sentiment and no less attached to authority than the British. He described George Washington as a high-flying aristocrat and he found the aristocracy of money and achievement in America less to his liking than the European aristocracy of birth. The United Irishmen reformed in 1796 and began seriously to look to France to support a rising in troops. Theobald Wolfe Tone went to Paris to persuade the French government to send an expedition to invade Ireland. In 1796, he arrived in Paris and had interviewed with members of the Revolutionary Directory, who were impressed by its energy, sincerity, and ability. A commission was given him as adjutant general in the French army. He wrote a memorandum calling for a force of 20,000 French troops commanded by a leading French general to be landed near Dublin. General Lazare Hoche a long-time advocate of French invasion intervention in Ireland, and Lazare Carnot, in charge of the Directory's war strategy, committed themselves to the plan. Tone had helped turn French attention towards Ireland, and his skillful advocacy would keep Ireland at the centre of French plans for the rest of the year. The French Directory planned a military landing in Ireland to support the coming re revolution foretold by Tone. The Directory for it possessed information from Lord Edward Sturge and Arthur O'Connor, confirming Tone's assurances, and prepared to send a uh, dispatch an expedition under Louis Lazar Hoche. Sadly, on, on December 15, 1796, the expedition, consisting of 43 sail and carrying about 14,000 men with a large supply of war material for distribution in Ireland, failed from Brest, accompanied by Tone. Unfortunately, they waited for days out Bantry Bay, waiting for the winds to cease, but eventually they had to return to France. The weather was never with Ireland. Tone served for some months in the French army under Hoche, who had become the French Republic's Minister for War after his victory against the Austrians in the Battle of Neuwied on the Rhine in April 1797. Unfortunately for Ireland, General Hush died of tuberculosis on September 19, 1797 in Western, after returning to his command on France's Rhine frontier. In Ireland, the membership of the United Irishmen had reached 300,000, about 6% of the population, but a vicious counterinsurgency campaign in 1797 weakened the organisation and forced the leadership to launch a rising without French aid. More importantly, the Roman Catholic hierarchy was completely opposed to the United Irishmen as they were allied to the French who had just invaded Rome and set up the anti clerical Roman Republic. Napoleon Bonaparte, with whom Tone had several interviews at the time, was less disposed than Hosh had been to undertake an Ireland and Irish expedition. And when the rising broke out in Ireland in 1798, he had departed for Egypt. When Tone urged the Directory to send effective assistance to the Irish rebels, all that could be promised was a number of raids to send simultaneously around the Irish coast. One of these, under General Jean Hubert, succeeded in landing a force near Kalala in County Mayo and gained some success in Connacht at Castlebar before it was subdued by General Lake and Charles Carnwallis. Wolf Tone's brother Matthew was captured, tried by court martial, and hanged. A second raid, accompanied by Nathan <coughs> came to disaster on the coast of Donegal, while Wolf Tone took play a part in a torch under Admiral Jean Baptiste Francois Bompard, with General Young Hardy, in command of a force of about 3,000 men. He encountered the British squadron at Doxville on uh, October the 12th, 1798. Tone, on board the ship Hoche, refused Bompard's offer of escape in a frigate before the Battle of Tory Island and was taken prisoner when the host surrendered. He was brought ashore at Letterkenny Port and all French forces were taken to Lord Cavan's Letterkenny home where, where George Hill re recognised Tone. He was at his trial by court-martial in Dublin on November the 8th, 1798. 
Wiltshire made a speech avowing his, his determined hostility to England and his, ten, his intention by frank and open war to procure the separation of the countries. Recognising that court was certain to convict him, he asked only that the court should judge me to die the death of a soldier and that I may be shot. He defended his view of a military separation from Britain as had occurred in the United States and explained his motives. Under the flag of the French Republic, I originally engaged with the view to save and liberate my own country. For that purpose, I have encountered the chances of war among strangers. For that purpose, I have repeatedly braved the terrors of the ocean, covered as I knew it with the triumphant fleets of that power, which it was my glory and my duty to oppose. I have sacrificed all my views in life. I have courted poverty. I have left a beloved wife, unprotected, and children whom I adored, fatherless. After such sacrifices in a cause which I have always conscientiously considered as the cause of justice and freedom, it is no effort at this day to add the sacrifice of my life. And to the Irish people he had the following to say. I have laboured to abolish the infernal spirit of religious persecution by uniting the Catholics and the centers. To the former I owe more than ever can be repaid. The service I was so fortunate as to render them, they rewarded munificently. But they did more. When the public cry was raised against me, when the friends of my youth swarmed off and left me alone, the Catholics did not desert me. They had the virtue even to sacrifice their own interests to a rigid principle of honour. They refused, though strongly urged, to disgrace a man who, whatever his conduct towards the government might have been, had faithfully and conscientiously discharged his duty towards them, and in so doing, though it was in my own case, I will say, they showed an instance of public virtue of which I know not, know not whether there exists another example. His eloquence was in vain and his request to be shot was denied. On November 10, 1798, he was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged on November 12. Before this sentence was carried out, he was mortally wounded in suspicious circumstances. Military Sergeant Be Benjamin Latane treated Tone just hours before he was due to be hanged. A pamphlet published in Latin by the doctor some years later after Tone's so-called suicide refers to an unusual nestling suffered by an unnamed patient, which indicated that a bullet passed to his throat, and this has led to speculation that Tone may have been shot. Theobald Wolf Tone died on November 19, 1798, at the age of 35 in Provost Prison, Dublin. He is buried here in Bodenstown, and his grave is in the wonderful care of the National Graves Association. His journals, which were written for his family and intimate friends, were published in Washington, D.C. in 1821 by his son, Th William Theobald Wolfson. He was adopted by the Young Ireland Movement of, 19, of the 1840s as the father of Irish Republicanism and above religious division. Thomas Davis found and publicised the location of Tone's grave in 1843. He inspired the Young Irelanders, the Fenians, the men and women of 1916 of the War of Independence, and all of us who have continued the struggle to remove the British presence from Ireland down the years. And as we stand here at his gravesite, we repeat his words. Subvert the tyranny of our ex government, to break the connection of England, the never-failing source of all our political evils, and to assert the independence of my country. These were my objects. To unite the whole people of Ireland, to abolish the memory of all past dissensions and to substi substitute the common name of Irishmen in the place of the denominations of Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. These were my means. If the men of property will not support us, they must fall. Our strength shall come from that great and respectful class, the men of no property. Something that strikes one when looking at the life of Tone is his normality. He was a man who liked the good things of life. He liked to drink in good company. He dearly loved his wife and children, but he sacrificed an ordinary life for the good of his country. He has become an icon iconic figure whom we all look up to and aspire to, but he was very human. His diaries would reveal his deep knowledge and love of English literature, especially Shakespeare and the theatre, exhibits his fondness for irony and self-mockery, conveys an impatience with anything that looks like humbug or pretentiousness, and communicates a sense of fun and gaiety that has endeared him to readers ever since. As we look at the present situation in Ireland, we know it is not the Ireland. Tone, Emmett, the Fenians, Pierce, Connolly, Brewer, or the H. Black Hunger Strikers strike fought and died for. Once again, former Republicans have, have hijacked the cause of an Ireland free from British rule. 
Toad and his successors would not have been satisfied with a border pole. Ireland is one country, one nation and one people, whether its people be nationalist or unionist. That is what Sinn Féin public stands for. A new Ireland where all the people can come together in a constituent assembly and decide on a new constitution. We will bring our policy documents to such an assembly. We stand with Tone, Connolly, Pearson, Stan and Sands. With Tone, we say, break the connection with England. With Connolly, we serve neither King nor Kaiser, but Ireland. With Pierce, Ireland and Fee shall never be at peace. And with Sands, we must see our present fight right through to the very end. And one final thing, we should not go away from here today without mentioning the extradition of an Irish citizen to Lithuania by the Free State Government. Dean Campbell is charged in political offences and the British government refused to extradite him on the basis, quote, that he was likely to be held in conditions which could be inhuman and degrading. A 2019 United Nations Committee Against Torture report in Lithuanian prisons expressed serious concerns about the conditions in which prisoners were held across the entire Lithuanian prison system. It is shocking that a so-called Irish administration would extradite a citizen such a regime Sinn Féin public has always opposed political extradition of a citizen to a foreign country and will continue to do so. And we send solidarity greetings to Liam and his family. We're of Mila Mahagruz. And Fabluk de Boom. For Mila Mahagruz, Lisa. Nila. More on Ella, a death and share a car. Is an orod Russian, a cohort of Hussein, the Lita in Yob, Arzaguni, and an orod Vra Hokshi, Glan Braver, we are in a public talk, Tibal Volton. The Intelate could you add to that? Both, in his own words, in T. Baldwell Tone's own words, break the connection with England. And that's the only way that the freedom of our country is going to come. We talk of changing times. They talk how we are in good times. We talk about the freedoms of all the other countries, but not one word about our own. And there, as Pierre said, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. We call on the British to once and all, and Mr. Boris Johnston, come and get your troops together and get them to hell out of Ireland. Because you don't belong here. You never did, and you never will. Neither does the two-state Ireland, the free state by Leinster House, and the northern state by Stormont which is accepted by former Republicans. And that's an awful, awful shame. Because you have broken the constitution of what the Irish people and the people who volunteered before you, you have broken the word. And if one doesn't have a word, they have nothing. Many went in to Leinster House to fight it from within. And they found themselves just as bad as their predecessors, the British. And I'll speak about Morris O'Neill and Charlie Kearns in Kerry. One county that I always think of that suffered with the exception of the six northeastern counties a county that suffered at the hands of the British and worse again at the hands of the staters. So let's be under no illusion where we are or who we are and what we are and what we stand for. We stand for nothing more or less than a free Ireland. And we will continue despite of harassment by the Dublin state or the Stormont, our Westminster. We will continue to struggle on until we get our independence. Be it long 
or be in charge. They say that England would leave providing they had enough time. Well, I don't know. What time do they want? They're here over 850 years. So I tell those lads down to my left here and ladies, talk to your bosses above in Leinster House and let's all go under the banner of Ireland. Because until we are together as a united nation, not two states, we will never have a day's comfort. And people will never know the path to take. And let's set an example to our youngsters who are unaware. Many talk about Sinn Féin. There is only one Sinn Féin, and they're here today, who never accepted going into any house, north or south, only to get rid of English rule in Ireland. Now, before we conclude, I've just a couple of announcements to make. The annual testimonial function in Wynne's Hotel, Abbey Street, on July the 23rd at 1 o'clock. For all the honorees that's given their life towards the Republican movement. The hunger strike commemoration in Bundorn in County Donegal on August the 27th, assembled at the East End at 2.30. Rory O'Brody, Autumn School, Abbey Street, Roscommon, September the 10th, 10 a.m. to 5.30. And also, I'd like to mention an honorary that didn't come up because of COVID. It's on Friday night for Frank Dowd from that fine county of Roscommon in the Bush Hotel in Carrick and Shannon at 7 o'clock on the 1st of July, Friday the 1st of July. Now, General Amselera, I'll hand over to your Chief Marshal. Thanks everybody. Hopefully we'll be here again next year. We don't know what a year brings. We had Dan Hoban here chairing this last year, you know, and many other Republicans who has gone. So we'll remember every one of them today as well. I will also remember those people who keep their head up high and stand up against all types of harassment on both sides of the British imposed border, north and south. Gromagi. Gromagot Hamash. Neil August Gromagot got dinner to Ilahrin Shah. Hanigas got got kunde. Fakim dinna awan os mokhor a makan sha as bawatlam rodegan a rafwe. Jonathan Hawthorne, recently released from Port Leisha Prison, is here with us today, and I'd like you all to give him a warm welcome. Jonathan went into Port Leisha. He stood his ground. He wasn't intimidated. Nobody bought him. And he came out an uncompromising Republican just as he went in. Uh, welcome here, uh, Jonathan. Uh, we will have now the playing of the national anthem, and I'll call on the colour party, Parad Ara. <laughs>
Oh,